This is Rob Tubbett for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. Delighted, as always, to be joined by Shane McGuigan. Uh, it's probably been a couple of weeks since we've done an interview, so it's long overdue. We're here ahead of Pro Grey Taylor. Um, how are you, Shane? Yeah, good, mate. You know, got the way in out of the way. So um, both Lawrence and uh, Josh got weighed in there. Both against hard fights, both against unbeaten guys. Um, so yeah, it's just it's the best part now. You get a chance to relax. They're in good spirits. They're rehydrated. They're, they're well fed and looking forward to tomorrow night. Both Josh and Lawrence are both considered to be big at the weight. How was making weight for both of them this time out? Yeah, both. Listen, like they make no mistakes. They're both big and tight on the weight, but. But the pair of them did it really well. So, um, especially Josh, you know, he did it really, really well this time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like the two of them are a good head taller than both of their opponents. So, shows that you know we've been they've been very disciplined in camp to get down to the weight. I mean, you know, Lawrence is six six five and a bit to get down to fourteen four is is a you know it's a, it's a good effort. But he does it he does it comfortable. Like, I mean, this is the second fight I've had with him, and you know he really he doesn't. He doesn't have to do much training on fight week. He just sort of watches what he eats and, and weighs in. And, you know, he doesn't put too much weight on, actually. I mean, Josh will probably be a stone heavy, be about 11 stone by tomorrow. So, which Lawrence will only be maybe, yeah, 10 pounds, 12 pounds. And for a big guy, as a percentage, is not a lot. But that's his, that's his optimal weight. He's nice and sharp at that weight. Obviously, Josh is IBF super lightweight champion, but because this is a unification, there's not the rehydration the next day weigh-in. Is that correct? Yeah, there's no ten. There's no ten pound the next day, so that's good. Um, but even that, you know, it's not like it's just more. We have to monitor it and make sure you know, see where he's at and where he goes to bed at. I mean, naturally, you don't put that much weight on anyway. It's the second day that you'll start to, you know, you'll still be still be putting a little bit more. Um, a little bit more weight on it's because they, they eat they eat such a clean diet and then when they start eating carbohydrates their muscles start soaking it up because um, there's glycogen in the muscle it starts soaking it up and that's just more water and and, uh, and, and fluid and sugars so um, it's like we would I would call it a superficial weight that you know what they uh, what they weigh in at what did you make of Regis Progo? Obviously, he had to he had to strip down, so he weighed initially. I think he was an ounce over or something, which obviously, if people know boxing, that's literally taking your pants off, so to speak. Um, Josh said that he felt like he looked dry, that he looked tight at the weight. Yeah, just give my camera a little kick. Makes a change from you kicking it. Can you take much from um, what you saw of Regis Progo today? Did he look dry? Did you think he was potentially struggling at the weight? He shouldn't be struggling at the weight. He's not that big, but you know there was rumours that he he was tight on the weight and he's took quite quite a lot of weight off this week. And uh, but he made the check weight and then he made the weight there today. So I made sure you know it was flickering. It was 140.1, 140.2, and then it went down to 140. But it was settling around 140.1. So I says, look, that's not. I'm not happy with that. And they were like, oh, okay. And th there's a lot of bodies on them on on the stage. So. You know, it was a bit like what happened with Taylor and the Baron check fight. You know, it's flickering all the time. So I said, no, no, settle down. And it settled and he was 0.1 over. Took his boxers off. And then there was a security guard standing beside me who had the towel. And he had his, he had his elbow resting on it. So he was like, what, one, he was 9, 13 and 8 ounces. And I was like, so move that fucking towel. And then they moved it and it went right back to 10 stone. It was flickering between 9, 13 and 15 ounces and 10 stone. So... Would say he was maybe he wasn't aware of it, but it was a it was a cheeky enough little move. Um, and yeah, he's got to be he's got to be on these guys. We've got to make sure that everyone plays ball and it's and it's safe. You know, it's just, you know when he's jumping on the scales at 140.1, he's he's on the weight. It's just he's got to take the box off. It's it's more of a humiliation factor. Um, Josh has been very revved up the last couple of days. Um, it's not alien to see him like that I mean he is a fiery character particularly as you zero in down to down to fight night any not concerns but are you mindful of that you're trying to keep him kind of sticking to the game plan or are you just letting him be himself it's Josh Taylor I mean when I was laughing about it there earlier you know we had a guy called Adam Mate over and, and he my brother had done the he'd done the uh, programs and he sort of wrote some quotes from Mate, being like, "I'm going to dethrone the golden boy," and just trying to hype the fight up. <laughs> and Josh read it. Yeah, well, he was saying to me, I can got straight in his face. And I'm like, Josh, we we wrote that. You know, <laughs> chill out, mate. He's a he's a he's a journeyman slash like low level fighter, and that's just who he is. He's just like 
not like he's you know he's 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 on it and he's clever and stuff. It's just he just loves a he you know he loves to to hype the fight. Not even hype the fight up. He just likes to to get in his opponent's head and show him that he's not messing because it's one thing he doesn't do and that's mess about. You know he's he's a serious bloke. You know you can you, you can joke about and then suddenly you you might overstep the mark and he's sort of he's just one of those guys. He's he's um, he's he's on it. You know what I mean? He's ready for a fight at all times. It's, um, but Ahara Davies, he had him throttled by, by the neck and everyone was like, oh, they've, Taylor's lost his rag and he's, Ahara's in his head, he's going he's gonna to lose his fight and look what happened. You know, I don't think it's, it doesn't affect the boxers. They've got 36 hours to really relax and get composed and then we've got two hours in the, in the change rooms to really settle everybody down and make sure we stick to the game plan. And, and if you respect your team and, you're, and, you know, the, and the instructions and that the people around you, it, on the build-up to the fight, the last few hours before the fight, they'll settle you down anyway. It's not the public and the TV read way too much into it. It's oh, look, he's he's revved up and and whatever. He's going to be, you know, fighting a different game plan, and it's just not the way it is. It's we have our structure, we have our game plan, we have an A, B, and C. You know, that's just the way it is. You know, it it does depend on how progress uh, starts the fight, but you know that's what we, that's what we've done you know, 14, 15 weeks of preparation for. You say you've done 14, 15 weeks of preparation. This camp was slightly different for Josh in a sense of he had the pre-camp with Luke Campbell. Obviously, he was preparing for Vasil Lomachenko. Campbell is sort of bigger than Progre, even though he's a 135-pounder. Yeah. Um, how important could that prove to be and how beneficial was that to have that leading into the camp for Josh? Well, the thing is, is Josh moved down to London last year and he, and he spent the whole time being in camp. You know, he, he won a world title and he spent, you know, took a month off back in Scotland and he moved down again and we had no date really and he was just in the gym working on things and yeah, he said he said to me like maybe, yeah, maybe two years ago, he's like, I want to move down here, I just want to, I mean, like, it's expensive to move to London but, you know, him and, his, him and his girlfriend, Danielle, they moved down and he was like, that was a big commitment from him to do that, to come down beside the gym so he can... Even when he hasn't got a date, he's just he's working on his craft and he's trying things out and he's, you know, and he's and he's trying to better himself. Or, but it's not at full intensity; it's at a low, a lower intensity. So we really ramped the the camp up in the last seven weeks. But he was in camp, obviously helping Luke out and the sparring. Yeah, you know, he was he was sparring. He wasn't doing ten rounds with Luke, but he was doing six at a fast pace because you know a professional fight, if they're a championship fight, they've always got six fast rounds in them. Um, and you know that that was that was good. That sort of sharpened him up. And then um, yeah, he's just he had some wisdom teeth taken out. So he had to be on a liquid diet a, a good two and a half, three months ago or something. And just just when him and Luke stopped sparring, and then um, and then he dropped down his weight down to like you know ten stone, ten stone twelve, ten stone ten, and that's in and around what he walks in the ring at. You know, ten twelve, ten thirteen. So he was on the weight for a long time, but I feel like the longer you're at the weight, the stronger you, you get at it, and the more you it feels normal and comfortable. If you're waking up at that weight for two months, it's much better than saying, "All right, well, I'm coming down from 11 and a half stone or 12." Some like well, weights come down from 12 stone. We're saying, "All right, well, I'm going to be walking in the ring at just under 11 stone." But really, by the time they spent eight weeks bringing the weight down, then they've only got another two weeks. They've just hit that and they've gone straight down again, so they've not really settled at the weight, so it's not really, they're not full of life, they're not vibrant on, on the, um, on, in, at that weight, and, you know, I think that people can, that, you know, that, that's where they get it wrong, if, they, if they're just, if they're fluctuating a lot, but good thing for us is that, you know, we had a long time on it, and he's super strong on it, it's, everything's gone to, to plan, we've had unbelievable sparring, we've had a guy called Lex, um, uh, Alexis Rocha in from his Golden Boy fighter, he's 14 and 0, um, welterweight. I mean, he helped Mikey Garcia prepare for Errol Spence, and he helped um, Canelo for James Kirkland. He, you know, he did some work with Canelo. He's, you know, he's a young guy, but he can really, really mix it up and fight. Really like decent puncher, but you know, in his fights on, on YouTube, you see him. He's a, he's just getting rid of the guys, so he's he's loading up, but he's got a lot about him. He can box in the back foot as well, so. Then we've had, um, you know, he obviously had the rounds of Luke and, and he had the, the rounds of Alfie Price as well. So we've had some just some quality work, you know, the whole way through. And um, yeah, it's all just gone to plan. But then the most important thing is just this last 
24 hours now, 26 hours because we're, you know, we're getting into the evening. And, and this time, this time tomorrow night is, is just where it all comes down to. And yeah, you got to make sure you, you you've ticked all the boxes, but you continue to tick all the boxes up until fight time. Do you expect this to be the most difficult fight of Josh's career? Physically, no. Um, I don't think it's going to be a physically grueling fight like a Baron check fight. Um, but I think trickery wise he'll have to just be on he can't give away free shots you know we know that we can't get he can't get hit by um by progre but progre can't get hit by him and the thing is is when josh is really fired up and the betting underdog i mean people really forget that ahara davies was the betting favorite going into that fight and he was i'm gonna smash this guy we were saying yeah you are gonna smash him but you gotta stay clever and you gotta Make sure you don't, you know, you don't, you don't get caught with anything silly, and it's very, very similar. Obviously, he's a much better fighter than Ohara Davies, but it's something that really gets his teeth stuck into him. He's, he he like he likes people saying, "Oh no, Taylor's, you know, he's a he's the underdog here," and you know, he, and it, it doesn't it doesn't wind him up. It just fuels him, and I think, um, yeah, it's just it's a fight that we've got to be very, very switched on. But it's also going to be a fight that. Because it's going to be a highly skilled bout, they've both got power. It's going to be exciting from the start to the end. And it's going to keep Josh Taylor on point the whole way through. Much has been made of Regis Progre and his punching power. Um, Josh kind of scoffed at that yesterday, really, and, and, and spoke about you know the Flanagan fight. He didn't knock Terry Flanagan out. And he's kind of said, well, when was the last time he knocked someone out? Do you think Josh Taylor's punching power has gone slightly, not underrated, but under the radar as it were going into this fight no, I think you know Josh isn't a one punch knock you out sort of guy I mean he can do you know, at, you know but at the top level he, he gets his knockouts from his combination work and um, you know, he works the body well he mixes it up and it's his speed he just he springs something on you and you just don't expect it um, but yeah I mean I just think an American fighter like Progre, he's quite naturally quite lazy. You know, a lot of guys like that are, they, they get success, they rely on their power a lot. They're so used to hitting people and getting, you know, getting an, uh, an, an effect. And I really believe that he, he just thinks as soon as, he, as soon as he hits Josh Taylor clean, he's going to knock him out. And it's just not going to be the case. It's like Josh has had 170 amateur fights, boxed all over, all over the world, he's sparred world champions he sparred bloody George Groves for Christ's sake before the Jamie Cox fight I mean we did quite a bit of sparring with, with Taylor he, he, could, he can handle himself and as soon as you put him up against people that are high, higher skilled or better he, he always raises his game so you know he hasn't shown his, his true potential on that and, and I hope that progress brings it out of him Elsewhere on the card, Lawrence Coley challenges for the European Cruiserweight title um, he's been very very relaxed not just all week. I mean, obviously, I, I come to the gym a lot, um, and he's been very relaxed throughout camp. A yeah. little bit more of an intense face-off today than we're kind of used to seeing for Lawrence. He usually kind of goes through the motions and then walks off the stage. He seems to be a little bit more fired up today and looking forward to this fight than we've seen him in some in the past. Well, I think he knows the task at hand. He knows that this guy is, you know, he's got a, a good team behind him in Dominic Ingle and, and the Ingle gym. Um, he's got Wasserman management as well behind him. You know, they, they, these are guys that, that wouldn't that wouldn't waste their time with somebody that's not that's not a good uh, a good fighter and a good athlete. So he knows the task at hand, and that, you know the the, re, the real reason he was fired up today is because the matching bus went without him. <laughs> he took a note of other people, and he was stuck there by himself. And he was had to drive his own way to he had to get his mate to come and pick him up. And he was fuming because he was waiting around outside. Um, out, uh, waiting for his lift but you know all the, all the transport was all gone so he got to me I was like oh, I'm, I'm just gonna I just can't wait till tomorrow and stuff I said let's calm down you know this is this, and Garbo's a nice guy you can see he's a nice polite person I mean he's a he's a true true throwback fighter he you know he's coming over here to to, to defend his um, title against Lawrence who's a you know he's a highly touted prospect so um, Lawrence will is super chilled really when by the time tomorrow night comes out around he's I've never seen him lose his call cool. just never seen it and like he keeps talking to me about it oh when I lost my call cool in the streets you know so well, you haven't lost your call cool yet so it's uh, it's a good thing do you, is that 
aspects not missing from his game, but would you like to see that more in him? And obviously when he goes into the ring, he's known as a big puncher, scores a lot of knockouts, but is that side of him something that you'd like to see more of in the ring? I believe he's made huge improvements um, of late, especially this camp. You know, last camp it was a bit rushed. He was taking a lot of weight off this camp. I mean, he was only not very far off the weight when he came in. Um, and he kind of just had a few weeks off and then followed it straight back in. So um, does he need to take more risks? I don't know. I think he's making improvements all the time. I believe like once he gets up the ladder and these guys like Ngarbu are going to have to bring that out of him. And naturally he'll do it because he's, he's a natural fighter. So... He's got a lot. He's got a lot of fight in him. He's got a lot of dog in him, and and you know, once once he gets pushed, and once people athletically can start pushing him as well, you're going to see the best out of him. And um, but do we need to go really having a dog fight with this guy? Absolutely not. He's five foot eleven, stocky guy. He can obviously punch with your hand, and you know, we needed we need to be clever and sensible, and and um, you know, and and stamp our authority, but also you know keep. You keep it long and box and box uh, to orders on the inside. And Garby is probably going to be a bit more physically stronger than uh, Matty Askins or uh, Isaac Chamberlain or someone like that. He's going to have a little bit. Yeah, you know, he's a he's a foreign guy coming in. He's a, he's going to have a little bit more bit uh, bite between the teeth. You know, something between the teeth. So uh, we've got to be careful. And he can't kill the clock on the inside. And he knows that. So the the sparring that he's had. You know, every time he's been getting close, break, step back, don't, you know, don't smother your work. And he's 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 improving all the time. I just can't wait for for tomorrow night. I really can't. And I, and I hope he really puts on a show and delivers what what I've seen and what he's really capable of because he's going to be a world champion. I know he is. You know, he's a, he's and people are writing him off and he's, he's saying he's boring to watch and stuff. I'm telling you, like he's looking really really exciting in the gym. And what's more is, you know, he's he's really learning how to stick to orders and also like how to keep the distance because he's he's so eager sometimes just to land a big one, you know. And and with that, he's you know, as I said, he's been smothering his work. So I'm looking forward to it. Caught up with your old mate David Hay at the press conference the other day. Um, he had some interesting things to say about Lawrence, and throughout the week he said some interesting things. He said that he actually believes Lawrence Cody has. Actually, he said in my interview the other day that he feels Lawrence Cody is the best cruiserweight in the world currently, and also in another interview he said that he he said that he's the best cruiserweight in the world currently. That's yeah, that's backslap central, isn't it? It's you know, um, but we have to go and prove it. So. So, you know, like David, David's seen him sparring against Joe Joyce and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it's one thing sparring, there's nothing doing out, on, out on, under the lights. And as all trainers, as all fighters know, you know, his gym fighters, these guys are going to really turn it on in the gym. And I just want to be able to bring that guy that I had to train in the gym out into, to, um, out into the real stage and just for the fans to really see it. And I'm... I wouldn't say David's David's wrong with that comment. I think he is, within the next 12 months, 18 months, he'll prove that he's the best cruiserweight in the world. Speaking of David Hay, obviously somebody you know very well, uh, Derek Chisora versus David Price. Obviously yeah. not the fight that was initially going to be on this card, it's the fight we've ended up with. I think it's fair to say that it's caught the, the imagination of the British boxing fans. Um, what do you make of that fight? Great fight. Yeah, really looking forward to that one. Um, I, yeah, I'm not going to put a prediction out, but it's just one of them. It's you know, it's heavyweight boxing. It's David Price just coming off a great win against David Allen. I, I mean, uh, so Dave Allen. Um, can he? Has he had the preparation that he had against Allen? You know, has he, has he had that proper hard camp? Can he? Can he keep Chisora off him? Chisora's a better fighter than Dave Allen. He's a bigger version of him. He's a harder puncher than him. Has he got a better chin? I don't think he has. I think he's been put out by Dylan White. He got put out by Dave, by um, by David as well. Um, he's got a very good chin, but I don't think he has a, a better chin than Dave Allen. So, and and one of the reasons David Price got that victory against Dave Allen is because he stunned him so many times and really, you know, kept him at the end of the shot and really turned them shots over. And 
and that was the old David Price that everyone's used to seeing, so well was used to seeing, and you know he he lost his way a little bit. You know he went to Dave Caldwell, he didn't didn't gel well. He's been around to different other trainers, and he's back in his in his old amateur gym, I think it is, and he's you know he's back with his old team, and that's that's where he feels comfortable. That's where he feel, feels that you know like he's you know like the people that really truly know him as a person and, and as a fighter, um, and that's what can bring the best out of him, and you know. I hope he does it. I really, I hope he does it because, you know, Chizor's had his shots. He stunk the place out in Monaco. He's, he's, listen. He's knocked out Takam. He's knocked out Spilka. He's, he's brought the the big wins out. You know, I mean, he had a great fight against um, Dylan White in the first one. Second one, you know, obviously he was doing quite well, and then he got and then he got knocked out. But I just, I really want to see David, David Price fulfill his true potential because he's such a nice big guy and I just you know I, I believe something like this can really just catapult him to back to where he he was before Tony Thompson. I was just feel a lot of conversation coming into this fight about who was training Derek Chisora he split with Dave Caldwell um, found out at the workout it was going to be Steve Broughton um, who's somebody you know very well. He's been part of your team in the past. Um, what can you tell people who are probably not as familiar with Steve as I'm sure you are about who he is, what he does, what do you think he'll bring to the team? Yeah, I mean, Steve, Steve used to work for myself. He, he worked about three and a half years, maybe. Um, just a, he's a nice guy. You know, he's... Uh, I don't think he knew about... You know, I think, I, I think Chisora was training a lot at shoot fighters with Marius and Alexis, two guys, two really nice guys, doing a lot of his conditioning down there. Ruben Tobias is doing the conditioning and and it's a bit of a it's a it's a bit of a, a, a kick in the teeth to boxing trainers to be like, okay on the week of a fight I'm just gonna announce my trainer. It's like well, I don't really need a trainer to to win fights and I don't know, has Steve had enough time uh to work with him? I don't know. I mean Steve hasn't he didn't do any he didn't do any mitts work so when, when he was under me. He did a lot of like, he's, he's good in the corner, he's nice and calm in the corner. He's done some cuts with uh, Tony Dodson. Uh, remember, he had a terrible cut on an undercard of David's, um, uh, David's, uh, Jerjai, whatever that guy was called, um, one of his fights, and he had a terrible cut, and he, you know, he stopped the cut. So he's, yeah, he's, he's had experience in title fights, but he hasn't, had experience when it comes to pads, getting guys sparring and you know, like proper sparring or championship sparring. So, um, and you know, but then again, Derek's done it loads of times. And as long as Derek respects Steve, which I don't know, I'm, I'm not in the camp. But you know, the, the fact that he's gone through Don Charles is a lovely man. Like Don rang me and and said, you know, I've split split with Derek and. And I was sad about that. I was proper sad because Don's the perfect person for Derek Chisora. Derek Chisora doesn't respect anybody. He has no respect for anybody. He says these horrible things. He goes out of his way to insult people. But Don Charles wouldn't let it. You know, he wouldn't let it happen. And when he's in his, you know, like, he obviously flew off the handle once or twice, but he was always a guy to reassure him and say, don't do that, do this, come on, you're better than that because he had respect for Don, Dom, and then um, he lost it. And, 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 he lo and he lost it since David Hay came into the camp. So it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a, it's a bad one. And then he obviously went up and, 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 uh, and then went with Dave Caldwell, and then that ended. Um, and, now he's, and now he's just choosing a trainer last minute and Steve is, you know, he's a, he's a, good, he's a good guy, he's a good trainer, but you know, there has to be a respect in the corner, and I, and I hope for Steve's sake that that's the case. I don't hope for Derek, Derek Chisora's uh, sake. I, I don't, I don't care about that. I just hope for, for Steve's sake that there is a, that there's enough respect that if he gets dropped or if he gets hurt, and he comes back, Steve can get hold of him and say, listen, you need to switch on here. You need to do this, that. Stop walking into shots, or keep that hand up, or tie him up if you're hurt. All just basic sound advice. The most important thing between a fighter and a, and, a, and a coach is that you have a rapport and you have respect. Mention kind of the, the things that Derek has said. Um, 
one of them was yesterday. I mean, piped up at the press conference and some of the things he was saying to David Price. Um, I think it's fair to say that in the current climate, those comments didn't really resonate too well with a lot of people. What were your thoughts on what he said to David Price? Just, I don't know. I just, I just thought he did some weird things that day. He put out an Instagram about Eddie Hearn, and then, and then David was talk, David Price was talking, and he starts with the um, with the phone saying that he's going to slaughter him and it's like a cow going to a slaughterhouse it's like did you have a did you have a talk and did did Eddie say okay well you you're now on a bit more of a higher percentage of the pay-per-view and then he's do, doing that I mean there's one person you don't need to he, he won't he won't come back at you with you know trash talk and that's David Price he won't lower himself he's a, he's a proper gent you know what I mean he, he, you don't need to do that this that fight the fact that Price is dangerous and he's vulnerable sells itself. The fact that Chisora comes and always go, has a go, and um, he's always in, you know, he's in exciting fights of his opponent is live. Um, it sells itself. You don't need to go in. Like we had a we had a death last last week, Patrick Day. He had a, a, ho a horrible thing for boxing. You don't want to be saying stuff like I'm going to kill you and take you to a slaughterhouse. It's terrible for boxing. It's a terrible, terrible ambassador for boxing and. And, and that is, that's just, it's, it's, it's stupid. It's so, it's so silly. This, you got the, you got the number one versus the number two. Josh Taylor number one versus Prograde number two. Best, best two like world, world, world weights in the division. You got Burns Selby. You got Lawrence fighting a, an unbeaten guy. You know he's a, he's a part of a pay per view show. He's not the, the main person. And the fact that. Everyone in the or in these good fights, that's what sells this show. You don't have to go and, and make a mockery of it. And I think just uh, it just it make, it winds me up. But he needs somebody to keep on top of him and, and not and not let these things these things happen because it's bad for our sport. I agree. Um, I will move on because I know that you have to get going. Um, where was I going to go with this? Yes, you. Let's talk about you. Um, you're back in the World Boxing Super Series final, um, looking to go one better than you did last year. What I want to know is, how do you feel that you've developed as a coach in the last 12 months, or not the last 12 months, since George boxed in the World Boxing Super Series? Just use that as kind of a starting off point. Very generic question for somebody okay, who yeah, I know yeah. likes a lot of detail, but... Okay, no, no, it's fine, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've, I've developed... No, I'm joking. I, no, I've obviously gained more experience. Um, I've had a boxer in Luke Campbell box an elite pound for pound fight. I've never had that before. So this year, I've had another world champion come through. My third world champion in, in Josh Taylor, someone that I took from straight from the amateurs to the professionals uh, world title. So developing all the time. I mean, the longer you're in the sport. When I was straight away, when I was fresh and coming into the sport, I was training Carl. He was my only fight. I was looking around and seeing all these other coaches, and they weren't grafting. They weren't out running with their fighters and they weren't doing the diets with us. Well, these, but he had no, when Carl was in camp, he had no uh, other fighters for the first two years or whatever it was. So I sort of trained with him and it was his company. And then since then I've brought more fighters in and the gym's like, just like any gym, just like Caldwell's gym or Booth's gym or Ingalls gym. It's like a revolving door. You're, you'll always be in business because you're a good trainer. Um, and Gallagher's gym as well didn't mean to leave him out um, but you know you'll, you'll always be in, in, in business and what you have to understand is you've got to make sure there's a level like there's professionalism and you can't break that line you know you can't break that line of friendship you have to be the coach and you have to stamp you have to call the shots and um, I just think working with more fighters a few have left a few more have come on um, it's just all gathering experience, and, and that is priceless. You know, I've always had Jimmy Tibbs in my corner. Um, he does the cuts, but it's someone that I really, really respect. I mean, he trained my dad at the end of his career, and he's in close fights. You need to know you, you got three or you got four people that's allowed in the corner. I need to know that all four people in my corner know boxing because I can get too emotional and think, ah. Oh, he won that round and, and then um, close, you know, you need someone as well to be in the corner that's giving you another perspective on it and 
you know, I've got I've got no ego. Like I mean, you know, I I, I want and you need help and you need other people that you respect in in the corner and you need to go through experiences. You have to have wins, but losses are just as valuable as the, as the wins. And I've had you know, I lost it with with Luke. Um, we've had a loss with Chris against React Ball, close, close fight. Could have gone either way, but if you were watching it on Sky, you'd have thought he got knocked out or something. But it was terrible commentary, Matthew Macklin and whoever else was there. We've joked about it since. Uh, Josh Taylor's dad's just giving me the, the fingers, trying to wind me up, trying to trying to get me off this interview. But yeah, we've had some, you know, we've had some losses, and and that's that. Yeah, that's, that's part that's part of the game, and it's. You got to keep getting back, and you, you know, you you have all these. You go through phases. You know, you have all these wins, and then you have a few losses, and then you got to get back up there and and, and, and wins again. And prime example is Joe Gallagher. He had he's a couple of great years. You know, he had three world champions in one year, and then he had a couple of bad years. But look at what he's done with Callum Smith. He's back. He's you know, he's just one trainer of the year, and he's he's back to the best. But he's back to. Yeah, you know, he's back up there again. He's he's you know, he's got his name back up. So it's like this is part of the part. I mean, me and him are we're on good terms now. We're chatting away to each other on social media and stuff. And it's it's fun. boxing's a funny old sport. It's funny how you can go from one extreme to the other. But it's um, yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world. It's great. It's a great experience. And I'll let you take that mic now. Thanks, mate. Yeah, it's a bit awkward. I think um, Boxing Social can have a little bit of credit for you and Joe now becoming really close friends because um, cause you're actually probably two of the most interviewed people on the channel. Really? So I think, yeah, you are. So it's, we'll probably take this like a, what's it, like a Cupid type situation. Like, yeah. Um, no, I think it's just knowledge. Yeah, I think maybe it's because we're getting, getting the most views. <laughs> nah. It's yeah. It's because we're probably two two big mouthpieces that that like the sound of our own voices and and uh, have our say. No, but appreciate your your time. You're very welcome. Before I let you go, I know you've got to go. Um, Chris Eubank Jr. versus Matt Korobov. Talk to me. Could potentially be the biggest banana skin for him. Just don't know. I mean, I've seen Eddie saying who's managing him, and I kind of got to agree with him. I mean, Korobov looked he looked finished. He looked shot when Andy Lee knocked him out, but he's since come back, give Charlo a lot of problems, and I don't know, what weight, is it a super middleweight? Is it back at middleweight? Okay, yeah, interesting. Know, he hasn't done that weight for a while, it just, it depends. Um, when you're with Al Heyman, you know, you, you, you're gonna, you're gonna have to, to fight a lot of his middleweights, and he's got a lot of good middleweights, so um, obviously Eddie has got Golovkin and stuff like that but I would rather if I was on Eubank's side I'd rather be on the DAZN channel because you got Golovkin that's not not at his best anymore you've got Jacobs who's quite old as well uh, those are two names that he if he was on the other side he he could have you know he could have got some really really good wins there you've got Callum Smith who's in the mix you've got Billy Joe Saunders that's there and then you've got Canelo who's just the golden goose but fighting Matt V. Korobov that's he was in 2007. I had DVDs, you know, when I was when I was boxing. I remember just watching, watching him, just thinking, "Wow, he's unbelievable. His footwork is incredible." And we all know that Eubank's not, you know, he's not he's not the best technical fighter. He's a he's a slugger, and he can, you know, he can, but he can great engine. He can work. He's he's getting better, um, and you know, he can um, he can definitely mix it at the world level. He just beat De Gale, but. But Korobov is is a is a slippery guy, and you're not going to find the target easy with him. But the one thing he, he doesn't have, he hasn't got a lot of punching power. So, I don't know. I mean, my my heart would say, uh, or my head would say, I'm going with Eubank. Potentially late stoppage, but if he's a bit flat, it could be a bad bad night for him. Have you got time for one more question? Go ahead. Okay, WBC franchise champion Vasil Lomachenko. Oh. This is it's one question which could go on for a while, so I apologise about that. Um, I made my feelings known on Twitter, so no one cares what I think anyway. Um, thoughts? Can you? Is, does that camera pick up steam coming out my ears or what? Um, 
Tough one, tough one to, to take. I mean, just Mauricio Solomon's a, he's a good guy, uh, but stick with your decisions, is all I'm going to say. Stick with the decisions and keep him as a champion and don't let a Devin Haney and just been giving Eddie a lot of compliments saying that you know he sh that's the side that you should be going Eubank and you know and then it's like now saying mm, yeah but he gave us a great opportunity he gave us a great opportunity to box the the, mum, the, oh, the the number one pound for pound fighter in the world technically anyway you know he's uh, he's incredible um, and you know Luke, Luke gave a, an, an amazing account of himself it's a it's a hard pill to swallow for myself and for, for Luke that you know, we didn't wait a little bit, but we couldn't. I mean, we were the number, we were the mandatory. So it, it's mainly just the WBC. You know, they 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 gave they gave him they gave him. It's never been the case that a champion of two other weight divisions becomes the the yeah you know, the mandatory challenger. So it's for the vacant belt. It's just not how it works. It's normally. It's, it's normally someone within the rankings, and when you're a champion, you're not in the rankings. And he managed to get himself into that into that position. The fight, look, Luke, you know he he learnt a lot from the fight. He hurt Lomachenko a few times. Did he box his best? No. Is there more to him? Yes. Uh, but it, was it always going to be the pinnacle? Yeah. And you know we we got we got chucked in. Uh, and Luke and myself, you know, we took the opportunity. He got very, very well paid for it. But Devin Haney hasn't done shit, and it's it's a it's a laugh. Yeah, you know, I mean, Abdulev, Luke would have chinned him in around. He was he was used to it. So he wasn't, you know, he was built up to be something he wasn't. And and I mean, Haney's a good fight. Don't get me wrong. I don't think it's going to be an easy fight at all. But it's it's about this is about opportunity and. Um, you know, we want that fight. We want to. We want Luke to get. He was, he's potentially going to go out on the December the twentieth uh, when we were scheduled for that. But having some conversations with Eddie this week, and you know, m me looking after to, to, of the path of Luke's career, I, you know, I, I want answers. So um, we're gonna we're gonna have a little sit down. But it's it's boxing. It's boxing politics, and you know. It, Eddie's delivered on a, on a massive uh, scale to get us that on a pay-per-view platform, but it's mainly disappointing about the WBC um, and how they uh, they're just chucking people in and out of championship. You know, here's a champion. Actually, he's franchise champion. He can become elevated world champion. I mean, if you're Devin Haney as well, you, I would be parading that around. I mean, he's fought Abdulev and got the interim belt, and then he's just been elevated to champion. It's like that's not how you should win it. You should win it against the top the best fighter in the world and he definitely hasn't done that so it's a bit of a joke um, but it goes back to the WBA used to do it with the regular and then the super champions and it's all that's wrong with boxing the best part about boxing is that there's there's a system and the WBSS have provided a system for us and tomorrow night on a positive note we will find out who the best 140 pound fighter is in the world and that's Josh Taylor we certainly will find out tomorrow night. Shane McGuigan, always a pleasure. Um, thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social, not just today, but seemingly every week. Um, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I'm sure I'll see you beforehand, but if I don't for some reason, uh, best of luck tomorrow night. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Rob, as always. Yeah, thank you. Good.